He just took care of that whole problem in one snap. It was that easy. <laughs> did it in a snap. He did do it in a snap. That's clever. Like Thanos, <laughs> he snapped his problems away. That's exactly what he did. He collected all the Infinity Gems, waited for this exact moment, and then snapped. Inevitable. And then the Jackal's sitting there going, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Aw. Don't make it weird. <laughs> Greetings, travelers. Welcome back to Tales from the Enchant Forest with your animal companions, Fox and Sparrow. So, Buona to everyone here. We're so excited for this one. If you've been following us on Twitter at From Enchanted or Instagram at Tales from Enchanted Forest, then you will know that we have a tale today from within our Enchanted Forest. We're shaking it up, I see. Not only do we often get tales from beyond the Enchanted Forest all over the world, today this one actually happens in a forest, which is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not even lost in the woods this time. We are just in the Enchanted Forest and this all happened. Our story comes from a great tradition in African folklore which consists of animal tales. This story itself has many roots and variations in different narrative traditions, including from the Ko, the Sun, the Kausa, and the Hausa peoples. We can find translations of these stories in Andrew Lang's Grey Fairy book and E. Joquette's Popular Tales of the Basutos. I originally found this story in Andrew Lang's Grey Fairy Tale book. We can see a lot of great stories coming from there. Unfortunately, that's not always the original, but we're going to get more into that later on. Fox, have you heard this story before? I have not heard this specific story before. I've heard quite a few stories about the jackal or the coyote uh, or the fox, but never in this kind of situation or trope. Mm. We see the jackal come up a lot along with a bunch of other animals that come around. I'm really excited today to talk about these tales because as much as animal stories are kind of sometimes more simple than the other ones that we have talked about when it's complicated human relationships, will they, won't they, royal bloodline issues, <laughs> but with animals, I think there's still something really fun to dig into with these tales. I agree. I think the simplicity is kind of a deception because we look at them and we think, okay, well, this isn't a very nuanced or very detailed story, but they actually hold so much information and so much about human nature, about morality, mm -hmm. about ethics, and about community. I think the stories really, really focus on what the main point is, and it tells it to you in a fun, interesting way that's not bogged down by too much unnecessary information. And by having them be animals, it helps because we don't need to know much more about a jackal than it's a jackal or a rabbit than the fact that it's a rabbit and it's fast. So by giving animals kind of these one line or one attribute, we can kind of figure out right away, okay, this is the good guy. This is the bad guy. This is the story we're telling. And this is the plot. And we can kind of figure out where it's going from there. As opposed to with humans, you have so many more emotions, so much more backstory. You need to set the stage. Whereas here, I think, with Animal Tales specifically, you set the stage just by introducing the characters right off the bat. And so you have more room to actually get into what it is you're trying to say, as opposed to lining up what it is you are trying to tell the story of. Here, you just go right into it. The Jackal in the Spring. That's the story. Yeah, and that way, animals are all stock characters. They're just easy puppets we can just grab and go. You don't need to do a lot of explaining. And they're ready for a fun tale. So with that, let's dive in to the jackal and the spring. Once upon a time, there was a great drought in the enchanted forest, and many animals could not find water to drink. So they all set up together to find a new source of water. Isn't it nice when animals from all different backgrounds and cultures can just come together peacefully to face a common threat? That line in itself seems like a fairy tale <laughs> and then they didn't eat each other amazing <laughs> amazing wow can you imagine if they just all came together and just ate each other and that was the end of the story so this isn't really that far-fetched because in the wild you do see watering holes as neutral territory between predator and prey there's kind of the unspoken law of when everyone is there all together, it's neutral, it's peaceful, you're not going to try and tax them at the watering hole. And so you have these really great documentaries and images of all these different types of animals all together 
in this one area. And it kind of sets a standard for the story where if the water is scarce, all the animals have something to lose and something to gain by working together or by not working together. And if they had chosen to not work together, they're less likely to survive, they're less likely to actually make it, whereas if they just come together, work together for a little bit, they can make a solution that works for everybody. It's a really, honestly, a fun, pretty image when you see pictures like that, where you see all different types of animals drinking from the same watering hole. But you also see that in our just day-to-day -day lives. We have all benefit by living peacefully with each other and working together rather than, you know, fighting each other over small resources. <clears throat> I would like to think that always happened, but I digress. <laughs> I think it's a natural step in society when there is a problem that needs to be solved and you need a community to solve it. The community comes together to solve it all at once. We go from more hunter-gatherer slash foraging societies and then we start building farms and building livestock and then we have to start working together to maintain the fields, maintain the livestock. And so you come together through necessity and you start evolving together afterwards. And ultimately, we'll tear each other apart because we can't all get a PS5 because of shortages. Where's my PS5? I don't know. Probably in some scalper's basement. I, I, they have all of them. I just want one. I just want to play Ratchet and Clank. <sighs> okay, I'm going to be okay. It's okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll all come together on the mutual threat of lacking game consoles and build a spring. Oh, that would be so beautiful. But one can only dream. After many days of searching, at last, the animals found some water that was deep underground. To get to it, they would have to dig. However, the jackal didn't really want to do all that hard work of digging just to get to, you know, the life-saving water. So he bailed on the group project. Sure, search far and wide with all your animal buddies for water, but now that you find it, you don't want to hop over the finish line? Really? Really, buddy? So, all the animals, minus the jackal, all dig for the water until finally they have a great spring. Yay! Yay! It's party time! You know, it's probably a pool party, people get some margaritas going, or I don't know what they would drink. This is probably really lame, but all I'm thinking of is the scene in Madagascar where they're all dancing together <laughs> as, like, the celebration at the end, or in Shrek, like, when they have all of the different fairy tale characters come together. That's what I think of when I think of a party. <laughs> pa pa party hey, I'm not sure. I don't go to pool parties that often. I, I don't like to get my feathers wet, so. <laughs> <laughs> the animals all agree that the jackal should not get to enjoy the spring water since he did not help with the dig. Honestly. It's fair. Yeah. Fair. I don't blame him. I wish more teachers would recognize when you have the one person you're just carrying in the group project. To make sure that they keep the freeloader out, they decide to sign a bouncer. And after much to absolutely zero discussion, they decided that the best choice was the rabbit. Yes, the rabbit. And we're not talking about a Bugs Bunny rabbit either. No, the best choice to keep a meat-eating predator away from the life-saving spring is a small rabbit. I don't know what to tell you. The rabbit was the best choice to be the bouncer. <laughs> it is It is a bit weird, considering when you think about it, the huge range of animals they might have had, mm -hmm. and also the, you know, the different animals that had to dig the spring and everything. So I think it's actually really great they have the rabbit do this. And there's two reasons. The first one being that I'm sure whatever reasons we have about, you know, a, a herbivore, a small prey animal trying to keep a predator away, I think it helps reestablish the idea of a society that's built together by everyone and not just the strong and the brave. It's by every single member, including the smallest members, the rabbits, who have a lot to lose by this. Um, I mean, the rabbit could easily get eaten by the jackal. It's not really a threat to the jackal, but the idea of just someone standing guard it should be enough of a deterrent to someone who is a freeloader, really. Uh, the second reason I like the rabbit, I really like the imagery of the small Judy Hopps type rabbit trying to keep, you know, this jackal-like, fox-like creature away. And I don't know, I think it, it's... It says a lot about the type of society you're trying to build when every voice counts. So if the rabbit volunteers to do something, 
the other members aren't just going to laugh it off and say, well, you're a rabbit, you can't do that. They're going to allow this to take place. They're going to allow this person who wants to defend the spring to defend the spring. And it gives this kind of weird equality, I guess, to the situation because if the rabbit hadn't volunteered, I don't think they would have been chosen, but their wishes are respected in this case by everyone from the lion to the other giant animals to the other smaller animals. And that says a lot about the type of side they've built. Yeah, but if you have like a thief trying to come in and steal your, just say, PS5, <laughs> and you're trying to protect it, I would not assign the small child to defend my PS5. I would be asking, you know, someone who is maybe just as big, or at least in theory, if they came at them, they could defend themselves. I'm just trying to think logistically right now how that rabbit would protect the spring. Its best bet would be to run and get help, but at that point, the jackal's still pretty fast, so it could probably catch it or either just drink and then run away and be fine. Like... I don't know. Logistically, I'm like, this doesn't add up. <laughs> well, logistically, I don't think it adds up. But if we look back to the actual tradition of the jackal and the rabbit and the other types of animals within the greater African folklore, you do see that the jackal is more of a, I guess, trickster character in some traditions. The trickster is defined by their characteristics that don't necessarily mesh well with being part of a society. So they're selfish. They do things for themselves. And they are kind of on the outskirts of the community, but they do know the rules. They do know the social structure. They know what they need to be doing, and they choose to not do that. So the jackal understands the social repercussions of going against even the smallest rabbit who's part of this community. And so the jackal isn't going to outright kill the rabbit or hurt the rabbit. They're going to find a way to manipulate the situation. And I think the other animals understand this as well. They know the jackal won't outright hurt the other characters uh, because that would have just so, that would be complete exile. That would be, that would make them an outcast in the truest sense of the word. In the sense that they are now, they're outcast only in their character. And I think having the rabbit choose to be the defender also plays up to the idea that some of these stories were told to children. And when you tell children tales like this, you want them to feel like they are also part of society. They are part of this construct that they're building. And these types of folk tales, these types of myths, they're all there to help build up some kind of identity. And so when you have a creature like a small rabbit, who we're making them alike to a child, be the defender of the spring, I think it shows children that even they can be part of this society that holds this value. And so... So the child or the rabbit, whatever we are calling the metaphor for this small creature who is more or less defenseless, um, what we are trying to tell them is that you have a part to play and you can play that part and no one's going to take that away from you. And so from here on in, it's the idea of the jackal and the rabbit going against each other, not just in strength or in size, but more so on, I guess, intelligence or merit or ethics wits. or wits yes it's about it's about what they choose to do psychologically or in conversation with each other or socially as opposed to A rumble uh yeah it's it's not about them going head to head in size or in prowess or whatever it is because a jackal would obviously win every time it's more so about the psychological way they're going to fight their social interaction the way they're going to manipulate each other in those kind of ways i i hear what you're saying when you put it that way, it does sound very beautiful. You know, you, you're making sure everyone in your society has a place, even a child. I still think it's strange pick. I, I would at least leave two rabbits. <laughs> consider, consider that. But, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe I am just not giving this rabbit enough credit. We'll see. Let's, let's find out what happens next. So once all of the animals agree to letting this poor single rabbit who has volunteered very bravely to be the one guard of this spring, all the animals go their separate ways, leaving only the rabbit behind. But the rabbit isn't alone for long because shortly after, the jackal comes to the spring and says, Hello, rabbit. The rabbit politely replied, Hello, jackal. The jackal then proceeds to pull out a single honeycomb from his bag, 
and tells the rabbit he doesn't need the spring water for a few drops of honey from his honeycomb will quench his thirst for days, and it's very delicious. The rabbit asks if he can have some, to which the jackal agrees, giving him one drop. It, it's delicious, the rabbit exclaims. Please, give me some more. The jackal says, of course, but I'll have to tie you to the ground and feed it to you. Travelers, you can probably guess why the jackal might tell the rabbit this, but sadly, our rabbit friend does not have the foresight or any ability to question such a bizarre requirement, and so he agrees, and the jackal ties up the rabbit, and then he proceeds to drink as much as he likes from the spring before heading back to his den. Who saw that coming? I saw something coming, but I did not see it coming in this specific way where the rabbit is just straight up like, oh yeah, sure, tie me to the ground and feed me honeycomb. <laughs> I feel like it's so bizarre. But I think it's it's a good, it's a very clever way of showing this because it's so silly. And to the reader or to the people who are listening to the story, I feel a bit outraged because I'm like, this is so very obviously a con. You're being conned. Come on, like, rabbit, get it together. I was defending you a second ago. Don't let us down, buddy. And <laughs> he just straight up lets himself be tied to the ground. I think that's the reaction the storyteller is looking for because it's ridiculous. It's, it's silly. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But to the person who's in that moment, to the rabbit, to him, he's getting some honeycomb. And I think in this moment, he's blinded by wanting something so bad that he forgets his purpose and he forgets who he's speaking to. So it can be alluding to the fact that when people are deceived by either, you know, riches or extravagance or something else they don't need, they kind of lose sight. And to other people, they, other people can clearly see that what's happening is ridiculous. But to the person in that moment who is craving after something, to them, it's absolutely reasonable. Mm -hmm. Additionally, when the jackal approaches the rabbit, he says hello. He he greets the rabbit politely, and the, the rabbit responds, thus establishing some unsaid social contract that we all have with each other, that if we're going to treat each other well, these are some of the social norms that we abide to. And when we do, we know we can trust one another. It's one of those really subtle things that we do every day, and the jackal goes out of his way to do so, thus putting the rabbit slightly at ease so that when he talks a little bit more he's already in some form of good grace with the rabbit even though he might not quite be aware of it yeah i agree i think it's all about playing into society playing into what is expected and using the play norms play. <laughs> and using all of the norms and constructs to create kind of your own reality and to make your own version of it and by manipulating it the jackal is showing that he does know what is right and what is wrong. He knows that he's not allowed to be there. He knows that he had no part of it. This rabbit's there specifically to keep him out. And he kind of puts the rabbit at ease and then asks him to, you know, here, have a little bit, gives him a little taste of it. And then once the rabbit is hooked, he goes, okay, well, this is what you have to do and I'll give it to you. Um, and so he's changing the rules of the interaction very subtly. He starts off just by saying hello, forcing a hello back from the rabbit because it's polite and you're expected to, you know, if someone says hello to you, you say hello back. Well, just kind of those like those, those things that are, you know, ingrained in us that we have to do. If someone puts their hand out, you know, you give your hand in return, you say hello. I think it's also because humans and, you know, these animals that are supposed to represent different humans, I think we don't like awkwardness we shy away from awkwardness no. we hate cringy moments we hate not being able to do what's expected of us and so when an uncomfortable situation is potentially about to occur we will try and avoid it and yes. i'm like you know i'm not speaking about myself i think it's, it's not universal but i think it's accepted that when people are faced with something uncomfortable they either tend to deflect or shy away or try and change the subject and so I mean, we have lots of passive-aggressive interactions as human beings where we don't directly approach the idea or the problem. We go around it. And this is a very passive-aggressive exchange. I mean, the rabbit knows the jackal isn't supposed to be there. The jackal knows he's not supposed to be there. And they're kind of skirting the issue because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to say, sorry, you can't be here. And it's uncomfortable to say, well, I know I wasn't invited, but I showed up to the party anyway. It's, it's weird. And so... 
they don't like and I think this is where the jackal has the upper hand is because he doesn't seem bothered by this uncomfortable like situation he's just thriving he's like I've shown up to this party I'm not invited I'm here to crash I don't care but the rabbit is the authority figure in this situation they don't know what to do because it's like well you've shown up and you're not supposed to be here and you know you're not supposed to be here but how do I approach this with you because there are no rules to it like how do you how does a small rabbit get tell a jackal to go away it's like when a karen starts yelling at a teenager working at a fast food place and you're just like please just be chill we we know you're taking advantage of the situation because you don't care but like this person doesn't know exactly what they're doing at this time or maybe they just don't even care but it's, (laughs) it's just sad another interaction this reminds me of is when you have teenagers who are in the jackal position where they know they're not supposed to be doing something and you have an adult figure telling them to stop. And the teenagers just, they make you defenseless because they have just a comeback to everything. It's so quick with them. They're like, well, you know, you need to relax, chill. We're not hurting anyone. We're leaving. Come on, bro, like relax. And I have have younger brothers and they speak like that and they say things like that, like, come on, bro, just chill. And I'm like, well, they make you feel like you're on the defensive now because you're having to explain why you're upset, why something is wrong. And so I feel like the party that gets riled up is always the party that loses to some respect because yeah. you rise and, you know, they got a reaction out of you or you stop thinking well, straight. Well, I think they lose in the moment. In the long run, the jackal doesn't always necessarily win. The other animals are pretty upset with the rabbit. He, he tricked me, cried the rabbit. The other animals uh, agreed they needed someone a bit sharper to guard the water. So they went with the next best choice. The one, the only, the hare? The hare? Really? Okay. All right. The rabbit didn't work out. We're going with the hare. Okay. Maybe, maybe they just, they have a ton of rabbits and hares. And they're like, all right, we got tons of these guys. I kind of get the feeling that these guard choices are maybe not so much based on volunteers or, you know, who's the best qualified, but rather who got the short end of the stick. <laughs> you know, I I wonder if there might be some inner bullying going around, like who's at the bottom of the totem pole, but that we think could maybe survive this encounter. Well, I think in a version that's very similar to this story, I think it was called The Jackal and the Dam. I think the other creatures volunteered. Um, And I think it was very expressly said that they all volunteered. Do you remember if the, if the Andrew, if the Andrew Lang volume Uh, says they did? The Andrew Lang version was not clear. It kind of just, they said that all the animals agreed from what I can recall. So I assumed it was a collective decision, but a vote. They were like, ah, yes, you. I assumed it was a vote, but that vote could have been, you know, the rabbit going, I volunteer as tribute, but I also could have been like, make Tiny over there do it. (laughs) He was not good at digging. He should step it up, (laughs) said the hippo. Maybe the other animals were just really tired after all of the digging for this well that they were, they wanted a break. And so the smaller animals had to be the ones to take guard. Uh, And so in case you travelers might be wondering, the main difference between a rabbit and a hare is that a hare is generally a bit bigger than a rabbit. That's 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 the main thing. That's that's all we're getting. We're just a little little bit bigger. He's just a bit bigger by a hair. Okay, I'm done. Anyways, another reason why they might have had the hair go up next is the rabbit could have told them what happened, and the other animals have realized the the jackal is playing a tricky game. He's being manipulative, and so they send the hair up. In other folklore stories, the hare or the brer rabbit is another trickster figure and they are either the trickster or they play the trickster hero so it's someone that is technically the hero of the story but they do it in kind of manipulative ways Um, and so I think they might be going one for one with this this is just my theory of based on what I've read in the past and based on other tropes that I've seen the hair and body Uh, usually in the folklore tales or the animal tales you have one central trickster which in this case the jackal and one central either hero or, you know, savior character, which would be an upcoming character that we haven't discussed yet. So it's unlikely that the hare was sent up as a trickster as well. 
but I like to think that the other animals are kind of seeing that this is more of a social game the jackal is playing, and so they're sending someone out who can match the jackal's wit and cunning. Obviously, we'll see how it goes, but I think that if that's what they're doing, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Because they're trying to play the jackal's game. They're trying to be like, all right, you want to play a social game? Let's play a social game. Let's send someone who's going to trick you back. You got to fight fire with fire, you know? But we don't want to burn the forest down. Please don't burn our forest down. We like well, it. Well, we have a drought. What goes well with the drought? A forest fire. <laughs> Said no one ever. Travelers, you might think that this will work. We have a trickster versus another trickster. Hare versus jackal. The ultimate throwdown. But I think some of you might be familiar with a thing called the rule of three and probably can guess where this next part's going. So once again, all animals leave and the jackal appears. The jackal and the hare, once again, both politely greet one another and the jackal pulls out his honeycomb and the hare wants to try it. Next thing you know, the hare is tied up and the jackal has once again drank his fill from the spring and he is left to go back to his den. So the jackal is 2-0 and getting spring water. It's a stunning turn of events. I never saw that coming. <laughs> Anyone who knows fairy tales knows what's coming up. We're in the third round. It's really exciting. The jackal has done so well this far in this competition. It's been impressive, but the animals got another trick up their sleeve. Oh boy, do they. The animals now know that they need to get serious. Now the animals know they need to get serious. <laughs> so, the panther suggests, and that's right, record scratch. It's this moment we have another animal actually named in the story, and it's a panther. There has been a panther here this whole time who has not done anything in the story i feel like if you just put the panther there the story would have been over the panther would have just scared <laughs> off the jackal but okay the panther suggests that the tortoise be the one to guard the spring and all the animals agree and so they once again go their separate ways so now we have the jackal versus the tortoise in the ultimate throwdown who will win? It's his anybody's game. Fox, what do you think of this exciting tournament? I think that this is quite interesting because the tortoise is another popular trickster type character. So it'd be interesting to see what he does. And maybe he's going to do the same thing as the hare. He's going to get, you know, excited about this honeycomb and let himself get tied up. But if we're going by the rule of threes, this tortoise is about to put up a real fight. It's interesting how many trickster characters we actually have. And how they all seem to be popping up in this story, with the exception of the rabbit, who had to be the first victim in the story, more or less. I was, I was just thinking that, because usually in the story, as I said before, you have one major trickster, one major hero. And here, it seems like we have other characters or other animals that are known to be tricksters as well. And the reason why, well, I mean, the reason why you have certain animals as a main trickster character or as a main hero type character is that when you're telling a story, and even specifically if you're telling a story orally, right off the bat, your audience knows who they're looking out for and who they're kind of rooting for and who the bad guy is. Uh, I say bad guy in quotes because the jackal isn't a bad, like a trickster character isn't necessarily a bad guy. They're just the anti-social character. I, honestly, I would not think of the tortoise as a trickster character. From my like the main story, I can think of of the tortoise is the tortoise and the hare, and in that one, the tortoise isn't really doing a lot of thinking. He's just hard working in that one. So I would not think of it, at least from my understanding, he's the slow character that will persevere in the end, or can be surprisingly fast. But thinking, I've never associated highly with him before. He could be smart, and I, I mean, all the power to him. There is another version of the tortoise race kind of trope story. Uh, but just a quick recap of it. The tortoise is the main trickster in that story. And what he does is he gets his family members to line up along the race course. And they make the other animal think that they are ahead of the other animal, which I think is an elk. But the other animal runs itself ragged, thinking the tortoise is ahead of it the entire time. But it's not. The tortoise is way back, and he, you know, he does a slow thing, walks really slow. But he does a trick to essentially win. And so there are lots of different stories where the characters, the animals, play different tropes. Uh, they're known specifically for certain ones. Um, and so it's it's weird that you would have so many of them, so many of the main prominent trickster ones, all in the same story. 
Uh, it could mean absolutely nothing, and we're just looking into it like English majors do. Or it could mean something. We have no idea. <laughs> no idea. Nonetheless, like the tortoise, we will carry on. Surprising absolutely no one at this point, the jackal makes another appearance. Hello, tortoise, the jackal says. The tortoise rudely ignores the jackal. Nevertheless, the jackal proceeds to pull out his honeycomb and tries to entice the tortoise to take interest in it. Even with that sweet, sweet smell of honey and the jackal talking aloud about how delectable it was, the tortoise did not acknowledge the jackal. The jackal thinks, What a dumb animal. I'll just kick him over. Uh, what a bizarre thought process, but okay. So the jackal proceeds to try and kick the tortoise over. And as he does this, the tortoise snaps onto the jackal's leg and holds on tight. The jackal pleads with the tortoise to let him go, but the tortoise silently continues to restrain the panicking jackal. Eventually, all the animals return to the spring, seeing the jackal ensnared by the tortoise. In a panic, the jackal finally breaks free and runs away, never to return to the spring, ever again. And the tortoise presumably gets a party thrown for him because, <laughs> dang, son, he just took care of that whole problem in one snap. It was that easy. <laughs> did it in a snap. He did do it in a snap. That's clever. Like Thanos, <laughs> he snapped his problems away. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. He collected all the Infinity Gems, waited for this exact moment, and then snapped. Inevitable. And then the Jackal's sitting there going, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Aw. Don't make it weird. We're not rooting for the Jackal here. A couple things right off the bat. The tortoise does not engage in kind of that social interaction that the other two did. Doesn't say hello, ignores it completely. Um, and that kind of refusal to take part in Jackal's games, I don't know what it does, but I think it drives Jackal crazy because it's it's bizarre to me that he would go straight to I'll kick him over. Well, I think he's just upset because now the tortoise has set the tempo mm -hmm. and has set the rules, mm -hmm. right? If you're playing a game and someone's not playing the rules, instinctively you get frustrated with it. It also just takes away his power in this situation of he's not saying the rules and he doesn't know what the rules are now because the tortoise is clearly not obliging by the the norms i would get frustrated if someone doesn't say hi to me i go rude <laughs> say hi to me i'm nice <laughs> i'm nice <laughs> so i guess yeah jackal is throwing a tantrum then because he's not he doesn't know what to do next and just as he's been trying to play up to the social rules to, con to manipulate the other animals, now it's, being ha now it's happening to him and he doesn't know what to do about it because he's like, well, I'm trying to set the tone here. I'm trying to set the rules. I'm trying to control this interaction. And by refusing to engage, you take away the only power the jackal has here because otherwise what's he going to do? Resort to violence and that's what he does. And violence is never the answer, kids. No, never the answer. Gets you banished from the spring. We've previously have struggled with some fairy tales having bizarre morals or takeaways, but uh, this one's a bit different. This is more straightforward. So what do you think our main takeaway is? I think it's, it's a two-pronged kind of approach. One is the approach of the jackal, which is the, I, the example of what not to do. So this jackal is the one that's lazy, so it's talking about, it's talking about how if you try to find backwards ways to getting what you want, without actually putting in the work, there will be consequences for it. Um, and in this case, the jackal tries to manipulate people as opposed to actually putting in the work himself. And he becomes selfish. He doesn't actually want to help anybody else. It's only about himself. Uh, and then the other approach is the one of what the good example is. And the good example is kind of the tortoise. It's about being kind of steadfast in your own social interactions, making sure that you understand when people are trying to manipulate you and not just going for it. Um, and not just, you know, blindly adhering to social constructs or social rules just because they dictate what to do. Uh, but also, the idea that silence is so important, the tortoise does not engage with the jackal at all, doesn't say a word, doesn't rise to take the bait. He acknowledges that what's going on is wrong by acting upon it. And the action is that he, you know, clamps onto the jackal and holds him there 
And that kind of mm-hmm. steadiness is what a lot of people are missing because you have the hare and the rabbit who are so quick and they adhere to the social rules. They speak to the jackal. They want the honey. They kind of lose sight. And they lose sight through words. It's the words and the promises that catches them off guard. Whereas the tortoise doesn't listen to the promises, doesn't listen to the jackal, doesn't give in at all, and just goes based off solely. This is what needs to be done. This is my job. I'm going to do this exact thing. And that's it. He's unwavering. Ain't nobody got time for that! Yeah, he's unwavering in the face of, you know, manipulation or pleasantries or even honey. Catch more flies with... Honey than vinegar, as they say. <laughs> or, you know, just ask them to tie themselves up and then pour honey yeah. down their throats. <laughs> also, you cannot catch flies with honey. I have tried. Instead, I think I've just been feeding them a snack. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I've never actually tried that. That's just always, you know, the go-to example of how to catch uh, flies. Well, I've tried. <laughs> and let me tell you, those flies, they they don't land in the honey they don't land near the honey they land beside the honey and walk over and take a sip and then they stay there and they'll move and like they'll fly around and bother you buzz off flies i've had too many flies the past couple weeks and i've tried to deal with them all (laughs) with honey or you know other ways with a spring in our step we're gonna make our way to our five fantastic finds because we are steady and consistent with that number one Stories told during the Myth Age help define and construct reality. Like creation myths, they explain the basics of why things are the way they are. It explains everyday phenomena, as well as overarching ones, like how humans came to be, or how the Earth came to be. Other tales are told to express values, identity, moral standards, and philosophical reflections. It forms a viewpoint in which society is viewed as a whole. Many Igbo tales use animals such as birds, elephants, and sheep as dramatis persona, to focus on antisocial traits such as cunning, selfishness, greed, and craftiness. These traits are shown as being unwanted and are taught to children as such. In other various societies, it is accepted that personhood has to be attained and is done so in proportion to one's participation in communal life. We often have archetypal portrayals of animals in folktales that show them with human attributes like cunning fox, swift rabbit, evil snake, or fearsome lion. However, even with certain qualities attributed to some animals, they are all an important part of the social order. So we have the slow and fast, the weak and strong, all playing on the same field. In a culture whose survival was essential to sharing, greediness was detrimental and could have disastrous consequences. People had to work together and were all essential in building society, no matter what shape they came in. Number two. After today's tale, I was intrigued by the jackal and decided to learn more. Though I was disappointed to learn that they don't seem to ever carry honeycombs, nor do they generally have pockets. Uh, but I was able to find some interesting nuggets on our sly friend here. A jackal is an omnivore mammal from the canine family, the same family as wolves, dogs, and yes, foxes. While the term jackal has historically referred to any wild dog, this tale is likely referring to the black-backed jackal, seeing as it is native to Africa and it also is considered a very ancient animal, having changed very little since the Ice Age. It often has a reddish-brown tan fur with a distinct black back and black-tipped tail. Its build is also similar to its cousin the fox, having a slender body, long legs, and large pointy ears. They are scavenger animals often taking advantage of opportunistic prey. Much like our story counterpart taking advantage of the guard's weaknesses. Number three. Tricksters are a staple all around the world and feature prominently in animal folktales. Trickster foxes are common in Europe and Asia, with notable members being the Japanese Kitsune and the European Reynard the Fox. In the Americas, and specifically in the Native American narratives, we see the trickster coyote stories. Now, African stories alternate their trickster with common ones being the tortoise, hare, spider, and jackal. The trickster is usually a character that embodies a primal self living within the social world. He has enough social sense to manipulate others and his situation, and he also has enough sense to know his actions are wrong 
In the Koi oral tradition, the jackal is an entertaining creature that outwits those like the lion by exploiting their vulnerabilities. However, in San stories, the jackal was not a trickster and had too many negative connotations to be used as an identifiable creature. Tricksters can now be seen all over modern media, the most popular one at the moment being Loki, the Norse god. Loki is known for being a survivor, and that is another staple of the trickster character. They hardly ever have a repentance sequence or die. They just move on to the next story. Number four. You may have noticed that there were zero, that's right, zero humans in today's tale. All characters were a variety of different animals, but they all talk together much like in the way we do. I'm sorry to say the animal kingdom doesn't normally work like this, and there certainly aren't any jackals with honeycombs in their non-existent pockets. Applying human characteristics and behavior to animals like this is known as anthropomorphism, and it's a very useful way to tell unique and yet relevant stories. This technique can also be used on any non-human entity, but animals are some of the most commonly used examples of this. This most often occurs in children's stories as a way to engage younger audiences in hearing moral tales with a bunch of cool animals as the stars as opposed to boring old humans. As we mentioned earlier, this also takes advantage of stock characters that we often associate with animals, being the quick rabbit, the steady turtle, or the sly fox. We can see all of that in play, and it's something we use all the time. As we can see with today's tale, this is a very old idea and dates back to, well, when people started telling stories. One of my favorite modern examples of this in action is Disney's Zootopia. It's an epic crime thriller of a rabbit and a fox living in a metropolis and learning to reconcile their differences. Even in this very recent fun blockbuster, this movie still plays on the tropes of that we talked about before being the dumb bunny and the clever fox. I also highly recommend it as it's just a really fun ride. Number five. While researching this story and many others, it was difficult to find African sources for the tales. Something we have discussed a lot in this podcast has been the changes in stories as they evolve from oral tradition to written ones. This is all the more true for African folk tales. African oral literature is something to be performed before an audience. In the process of translating and transcribing, the researchers in the 19th and 20th century shortened the narratives, removed repetitions, and got rid of songs which have changed the essence of the work itself. In Chinua Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart, he shows the main character listening as his wives tell their children stories, broken up only by their singing. Now, when translating for European audiences, the translators and editors would sanitize the language and concepts to make it easy to read and relatable for their target audience. It is no secret that these works often had racist undertones and were tinted by the perspective of the colonizer writing about the colonized. There was even false speculation that the idea of the tricksters were derived from European sources and not original African stories. All of this being said, we have focused our research on articles and sources that critically examine these early sources and provide necessary context to the stories. In the future, we hope we can preserve the authentic stories and have them be told as true to the tale as possible. Well, Fox, I know there's been a drought in the Enchanted Forest as of late, so I'm getting really thirsty and parched, so I'm going to go look for the spring if you want to join me. I might as well kick over some tortoises. And dear travelers, you're welcome to continue to journey with us as we find more tales to tell you. If you want to hear more from us and find out what our next tale will be, come join us anytime on Twitter at From Enchanted or Instagram at Tales from the Enchanted Forest. Or if you're old school like Sparrow, you can email us at Tales from the Enchanted Forest at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your questions, comments, and suggestions. So if you have anything to share, please don't hesitate. And remember, travelers, if you enjoyed what you heard today and what we do here, please give us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. It helps the podcast grow and reach new travelers to join us on these adventures. Thank you so much, travelers. And remember, there's always a place for you in the Enchanted Forest. And sometimes, if you stick around long enough, you might hear some bloopers. Us? Make a mistake? <laughs> Never.
Sorry if I butchered that. It's French. <laughs> it's all good. It, everything is just Greek and French to me if it's not written in very clear English. If it's not a tweet, <laughs> I don't know what, what's being said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because you're a bird. Tweet, 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 tweet. Transition music is transitional. Transition music. Transition. It's like elevator music, but less fun. It's like elevator music, but less fun. But less fun. It's like elevator music. Da 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 yeah, just open the window, wet them all in, and just embrace the fly. I have nation. I have watched a fly hit itself against the window as opposed to actually flying out the open window next to it. So they're not very smart. But I mean, it's maybe because I'm maybe because I'm giving them so Whoa, much honey. Wait, hold on, we're not flies. I'm sorry, that was very rude. Flies, you are very smart. We believe in you. I don't. We are not shaming I'm you. I'm shaming you. Get out of my house. There's a whole world out there. Go live there. Find a door.